interested in who we are as a church here. Well, now as we continue to think about our journey through Matthew's Gospel, we're at a significant transition point in the Gospel, where Jesus shifts his attention and ministry from the Galilee region to Jerusalem. Our passage today is that transitional passage, a central passage in the New Testament. And so as we prepare to enter this time of worship, listen to this prayer that we have from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would, please join me in our call to worship. When we look to the rock from which we were cut, and to the quarry from which we were dug, we see our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, who were alone until God blessed them and made them many. When we look to the cornerstone of the church, we see Christ, the Son of the living God. Beginning with Peter, God has made us into living stones. God's house will stand forever. Let us begin our worship. the Son of the living 
God. Jesus came back, God bless you, signed and signed with Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now, I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. He swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. Then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, Impossible, Master, that can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan can get lost. You have no idea how God works. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? <coughs> Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you, a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the Son of Man in kingdom glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to you. The translation of the Latin text is, Blessed are those who come in the name of the Lord. Will some give a
My dad's career was as a certified public accountant. He was very good at what he did, but he always wanted to be an architect. At least that was the message I received from him. My dad was the first from his family to attend college. My dad's family immigrated to this country from Wales in the late 1600s. My dad's ancestors always lived in Delaware and just across the Delaware border in eastern Pennsylvania. For 300 years, my dad's ancestors were laborers, store clerks, blue collar workers, all living within about a 75 mile radius. When my dad went to college, no one in his family could help him navigate that brand new experience. One of his required architecture classes, his first year, he didn't pass. He didn't know what to do, so he changed majors. Well, that was an incredibly pivotal moment in my dad's life. When I went off to college, I was a pre-dental major. Like my dad in my first semester, I ran into a course that I was failing, organic chemistry. I began to wonder whether I was cut out for my major. I was wrestling with what to do. Thankfully, my dad recommended dropping the class then trying it again with a different professor. So I did just that. I dropped the class then I tried organic chemistry the next semester with a different professor. For me, the new professor made all the difference. I not only scraped by, but I did really well. I also learned an important lesson about stopping and trying again. It was a pivotal moment in my journey. We all have these pivotal life moments. The same is true for our faith journey. Today, we reach a pivotal moment in Matthew's telling of the Gospel story. At the heart of the Gospel is deciding what we believe about Jesus. That is a pivotal issue for all of us. As people who have chosen to connect to Christ's body, we must make decisions about Jesus. We can't be wishy-washy about Jesus. So for you, who is Jesus? And for you, what is Jesus about? Answering both those questions is pivotal to one's journey of faith. We can't skip over those questions, no matter how tempted we are to do so. My friend Dale Bruner, in talking about the church, attempts to use language other than conservative and liberal or conservative and progressive, he prefers to use the words evangelical and ecumenical. I think his word choice can be helpful, and I think he rightly points out that the evangelical side of the church is great at focusing on who Jesus is, while the ecumenical side of the church is great at focusing on what Jesus is about. But of course, both are pivotal issues for our faith journey. Our passage today brings us directly to this pivotal point of making a decision about who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. Up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had been doing ministry around the Sea of Galilee. That was primarily an area of Jewish communities, but as we discovered through the Gospel, there were also outsiders. And we saw through the Gospel that oftentimes those outsiders, Jesus would consider them eventually to be insiders. At the same time through the Gospel, Jesus regularly called the insiders outsiders. We learn in our passage today that Jesus was going to shift his ministry from Galilee to Jerusalem. But before he took the disciples to Jerusalem, he took them on a significant detour. 
Jerusalem is about 80 miles south of Capernaum. Capernaum is the home base where Jesus would be doing ministry. But Jesus, instead of going directly to Jerusalem, 80 miles south, took the disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which is 40 miles north of Capernaum. Today, Caesarea Philippi would be right on the Israel, Syrian, Lebanon border. In Jesus' time, the Roman Empire had created two cities from which to rule that entire region. In both of those cities, over a period of about 40 to 60 years, there was dramatic building programs that took place. Huge palaces were built, temples to Roman gods were erected, big amphitheaters and velodromes were created. One city was Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean coast, and the other was Caesarea Philippi. Before going to Jerusalem, to the heart of the Jewish world, Jesus took the disciples to the heart of the Roman world, the Gentile world, the outsider's world. He took them to Caesarea Philippi. Jesus took the disciples to what we might compare to a state capital, to the center of not the religious world, but the political world. It was in the heart of that political capital that Jesus asked the disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? Then after the disciples responded, Jesus asked them, And how about you? Who do you say that I am? So why did Jesus not ask those questions in Capernaum? Why did he drag the disciples 80 miles out of their way to ask these questions? at the nearest center of worldly And why not ask those questions when they got to Jerusalem? Jesus asked those questions outside the Jewish world and in a seat of worldly political power to make it clear that our triune God is for absolutely everyone. And to make it clear that the work of Jesus is lived out differently from the way of worldly political power as well as worldly religious power. The way of Jesus, the way of God, is upside down from the ways of the world. So Jesus took the disciples on a crazy, out-of-the-way road trip to make this point as clear as possible. That these two questions, who do you say that I am? And what you say to them about are the two most pivotal questions for us to answer. How we answer those two questions will determine the path of our lives more than how we respond to any other question. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus about? The crowds who had been following Jesus thought that he was a reincarnated prophet. They thought he was someone from the past who had come back to life. But then Peter answered the question about Jesus' identity with the bold statement, You are the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. In response to Peter's proclamation about his identity, Jesus said, God bless you, Simon, Son of of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. Knowing God, our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit, comes from opening our hearts and minds to the work of God's Spirit within us. We are not going to grow in our trust of God's identity from teachers, preachers, books, media talking heads, or politicians. We learn about God, the nature of God, from opening ourselves to the work of God's Spirit that is within us. 
Peter knew the true identity of Jesus as God's Son, as the Messiah, because he opened himself to the work of God's Spirit within him. When we accept that Jesus' identity is that of the Son of God, Messiah, one part of the Trinity, that then is a pivotal moment in life. Because moving forward, our life will forever be shaped by that ultimate truth. Because who we choose to shape our lives makes all the difference. Who have you chosen to shape your life? Have you chosen the Son of God or you have you chosen someone or something else? Have you chosen yourself? Next, Jesus said to Peter, and now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is a, the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we make that choice, when we choose to put Jesus in the driver's seat, then we become rock in the work that God is doing in the world. We become a part of Christ's very body, the church. And God's work cannot be stopped. If you didn't think that the passage was already interesting, now it gets really interesting. After letting Peter know that when he chose to embrace Jesus as Savior, he then became a rock in the ongoing work of God's kingdom, Jesus then addressed the second question. What am I about? And Jesus told the disciples for the first time that he would submit to an ordeal of great suffering, be killed, and then resurrected. In other words, Jesus told the disciples that he was about sacrificial love, love that put others before self. In response to that shocking news, Peter pulled Jesus off to the side and told him, no way. That's not how it works, being a Messiah. And Jesus responded, Peter, get out of the way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea about how God works. This is such an important moment for us to enter into. Peter is both a rock, someone pointing people to the true nature of Jesus, and then in the very next moment, a Satan, a tempter, someone encouraging a way of living other than sacrificial love. This is such a powerful moment illuminating the nature of our humanness. Peter is rock because he confesses the true identity of Jesus, and Peter is Satan because he rejects the nature of how God works, sacrificial love. Just as it is a pivotal moment to accept the true identity of Jesus, it is just as pivotal to accept the work of Jesus, the work of God, as sacrificial love. Jesus went on and proclaimed, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me leave. You are not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self help is no help at all. Self sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself your true. As the Gospels have made blatantly clear, Jesus did not live life as a doormat. Being a doormat is not what is meant by self-sacrifice. Jesus boldly challenged both the religious and the political powers of his day. And at the same time, Jesus' way of life was to put others first. To live out of a framework of self-sacrifice, of sacrificial love. 
And as Jesus stated, when we choose sacrificial love, we become our true selves. That is a rather pivotal choice, isn't it? Whether or not to become our true selves. Over the last 2,000 years, more has been written about this particular passage than any other passage in the New Testament. Who do you say Jesus is? What do you say Jesus is about? Jesus is the Savior for the whole world. Jesus is all about sacrificial love, a form of power vastly different from the power sought in the world, like through political power or religious power. These are the pivotal points of the gospel message. What have you chosen about these pivotal questions? Who is Jesus? And what is Jesus? About. How are the truths of those two questions shaping your life and our life together in the church? Friends, let us be a people who embrace these two pivotal questions for life. Amen. Let's take a moment to be in silent reflection about these critical questions of the identity of Jesus and what Jesus is about as Liz does. Gracious God, 
just as you put the challenge before Peter and the rest of your disciples on that day so long ago. You put it before us, too, to consider who we say that you are, to choose you and your way of life and sacrifice, or to choose a way that might feel safer, but that leaves you out. God, we pray for the courage and the passion to follow you wherever you lead us, knowing and trusting that it is only in you that we will find real life. Only in you will we find all that we need. God, as we come to you this morning with prayers for our congregation and for our world, we trust that you not only listen, but that you hear us, that you are alive and active in this world. So it is with confidence in your power that we pray, Lord. Pray for peace where there is conflict. God, we lift to you today, especially the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and all around our nation. God, we pray for those who peacefully protest and who seek positive change. We pray that the violence surrounding these protests would end. And we pray, Lord, for justice, that the voices of the oppressed would be heard and would be listened to, and that real and lasting change that brings about a fuller life for all of humanity would come to be. Help us, Lord, as we struggle to come to terms with the truth of the racism that exists in our nation and within our own hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for diminishing or for ignoring the humanity in others whom you have so beautifully made and God, help us to turn things around for the better, that we may become a truly unified people. God, we pray for hope and for healing where there is despair. And we lift to you today those who have been impacted by Hurricane Laura. God, we pray for protection of life. We pray for comfort in the midst of fear and destruction. We pray that your presence would be felt by those who grieve and that you would provide what is needed for families to rebuild lives. God, where there is sickness, we pray that you would bring health. God, we lift to you today those we know who are battling cancer right now, going through treatments. We pray for those who are preparing for surgery or who have recently undergone surgery. God, bring healing to those bodies. God, where there is stress and brokenness, we pray for restoration of hearts and minds and bodies and relationships. God, as we continue as a nation and a world to struggle with the coronavirus, we pray for healing, we pray for protection, we pray for health to be restored to bodies and livelihoods. We pray for the hundreds of thousands around the world who grieve the loss of a loved one who has died from this virus. We pray for those whose lives have been completely turned upside down as a result of this virus. And we thank you, God, that you are bigger than anything that this world can throw at us. And we choose to fix our eyes upon you, the one who brings order from chaos and life from death. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we head out into the world, 
led us to be focused on these two pivotal questions of who is Jesus and what is Jesus about. And as we do that, let us join together in our benediction. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you as something he wants to do through you, where you are. Believe it. Go in his grace and power. The peace of Christ be with each of us. Blessings on the rest of your Sabbath and your Have a great day.